Hello. Good morning. Thanks, all of you, for coming so early. Lovely to see so many people here. My name is Andrew Keane, Senior Fellow at Cal Innovates. Uh, we're here for a panel, very distinguished panel, uh, entitled Music's Fate Awaits. But before we begin, uh, we're honored to have Congressman Hank Johnson, who's going to say a few words before we actually start discussing the fate of music. So, Congressman, do you want to say something? I was reading last week where um, there was a new discovery. It's, in fact, it was on National Geographic last night, and I missed it. It was uh, uh, a discovery in South Africa of some fossils of a um, iteration of human beings that was unknown. So it's like 4.5 million years in the evolution of, of man. And these uh, fossils were very, uh, they, they were buried. These were people who actually were buried together, the anthropologist uh, surmised. And so it's a, a, a whole group of people that was unknown to man and uh, so it dates us back. I'm, I can't really explain it, but I imagine if they buried themselves or if they buried th their loved ones together, they probably were uh, were um, making music back then. And I would surmise that probably percussion was the percussion instruments was the foundation of. Uh, of music back then, because that's all you had to do was just, you know, beat. You could send messages, you could make music. Uh, so my point is that music uh, is basic to human beings. And, um, and as human beings have developed, music has developed. But one thing that remains the same, uh, there's somebody that's making the music. And, um, and I imagine, well, as human beings got uh, more developed, we started uh, preserving uh, performances and uh, then distributing them in, uh, in various formats. Uh, but physical embodiments of these performances. And then so mankind has developed and everybody's getting paid along the way. Everybody's getting paid, uh, you know, in that chain of how music is distributed. I guess it's unfathomable that now people are not even dealing with physical embodiments, physical copies, uh, you know, just, just listening on demand and so that's how we have developed we've developed so much from back then 4.5 million years ago it's it, it's so we certainly have the wherewithal to overcome issues like how do we get paid how does everybody along the stream of distribution of music get paid uh, in this new in this new day and so that's what we're dealing with here today right how do we how do how does everybody get paid or how do certain segments of the distribution process get paid but um, uh, it's not rocket science but I'll tell you uh, we in Congress since we're up here so much and we are dealing with uh, issues, um, you know, we may not be at the forefront of how uh, your business models work. And so we need you all to explain to us where you are, where you've been, where you see things going. 
And then we need to be agile enough in, in our politics and in our mentalities to be able to, to uh, uh, set the policies that uh, will take us on, uh, will carry us further in our development as human beings. So uh, that's what it's all about. I welcome you here to uh, Capitol Hill. I wish that I could stay and learn more about what it is that you do um, and how you do it and how it affects others down the chain. Uh, but unfortunately, I do have other business to, to attend to, so I must depart. But I look forward to hearing from everyone. Uh, I look forward to looking at your reports and uh, seeing your results. And, um, and I look forward to being a, um, a positive uh, influence on, on the future of uh, such a basic, um, a basic uh, mode of human behavior, which is music. It's just basic. So I look forward to being a part of the discussion. Thank you all so much, and have a great uh, symposium today. Well, thank you very much, Congressman. And also, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Alexis Moore from Congressman uh, Johnson's office for helping Cal Innovate set this thing up. So uh, we have four distinguished panelists. We have uh, Owen Teal, who is an artist, uh, Katie Peters, uh, the Director of Government Relations at Pandora, uh, Trez Williams, who is the Senior VP of Business and Legal of Business Development and Legal Affairs at iHeart, and uh, Mike Montgomery, who's Executive Director of Cal Innovates. Uh, the Congressman spoke about music as our past, but of course, in collective terms, and talked about how it was instinctive and somehow uh, coded into us as human beings, which was very inspiring, I think. Uh, and of course, he also spoke about the digital revolution and how that both conforms to the importance of music in terms of our makeup, but also opens up some important issues when it comes to the business of music in the future. Music fate awaits, in short. I want to start with Owen, Owen Teal, who is, I uh, hope you won't be insulted, Owen, a young artist, certainly younger than I am, uh, just starting out in the business. And I thought before we get to the regulatory and legislative nuts and bolts of this issue, we could just very briefly uh, lay out through Owen what it's like to be a young artist, an aspiring artist, a guy with a lot of talent, uh, but who isn't nationally, at least at this point, known, what it's like in this new digital universe. So, Owen, uh, welcome to the Cal Innovates event, uh, Music Fate Awaits. Uh, what is your fate, or what would you like your fate to be, and, and how can we help you both in terms of this audience and this panel, how can we collectively help you realize that? Um, okay. Well, hi, I'm Owen. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, let's, let me start from the beginning. I come from a very musical family. Uh, my dad is named Bob Thiel, my grandpa Bob Thiel Sr. Um, Bob Thiel Sr. wrote and produced uh, What a Wonderful World, um, by Louis Armstrong. Um, so I come from jazz. I come from a world of, uh, of music. And I grew up with it. I was singing when I was a baby. Um, and I kind of stuck with it because I you know, realized it's something I wanted to do. And I had a voice of some kind. Um, and so I released an EP last year um, with my friend uh, Zach Seekoff who now goes to Yale. I go to NYU, I'm a part-time student. Um, and we put it out on SoundCloud, expecting it to go nowhere, um, as a lot of people do, put it on SoundCloud and expect it to go nowhere. And it went somewhere. Um, and you know, the Village Voice was calling us to write an article about us. And I, we were featured on Snapchat, and it was huge. And I was very, very lucky, but you know, music, the music's fate awaits, I, I, I don't know necessarily what my future will be um, because 
right now I'm so focused on exposure and I'm so focused on getting out there and getting my name out there. But it's hard once I have gotten my name out there to make the money that I I need and I deserve and that I'm you know I'm putting so much into this and a lot of people are playing it on Spotify or playing it on this or playing it on SoundCloud or free downloads here and that's all great for now but it's really you know it's scary to think of what my future necessarily would be if there's if everyone's getting my next record for free um, so yeah uh, what what else should I talk about you obviously you know your contemporaries very well. How are people finding? How, how are your friends? How do you find your music? Do you buy your music? Do you listen on internet radio? Do you download? Do you stream? A lot of my uh, fans right now have been through, I, I, I've been played on KCRW, um, a station in, in, based in Santa Monica, um, California. And, and so they have been, d different DJs have been playing my music. Um, and so a lot of people have been calling in or emailing or tweeting and asking who that was. And so that's how a lot of my fans have heard me um, and through college radios and different things. Um, but I, I find my music through SoundCloud. I find my music through Spotify. I find my music through, you know, the free <laughs> sites. Um, and not because I don't want to pay, just because I, I feel like if I'm listening to something, if, I, if, if something's new and something's, I don't necessarily know it, it's not a Taylor Swift album that you know, I, I kind of expect, I know what to expect. I, I want to be able to listen to it before I buy it. Um, and a lot of my friends I know are like that. So everything's changed since your grandfather's day when yes. record labels controlled everything. They decided when the music went out, they distributed it, they controlled the plants and the record stores and all the rest of it. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a good thing that music has changed, that that has changed. Um, but I also think that obviously it has its flaws and it's, you know, not all great. Um, but I do think that an artist being in charge of what they put out and, you know, an artist being able to be, not be signed to a label and put music out and have it go somewhere is so important. And I'm so, uh, you know, that's, that's why I'm lucky. I'm not signed to a label. So you I'm feel still. totally empowered. This technology is liberating you, freeing you to do your own stuff, to put it out there, to distribute it on different platforms, and to uh, bu build your own career rather than rely on other people. Definitely. For now, it's really amazing. It's really great for exposure. Um, it's really great to put myself out there. But for someone like Taylor Swift, who has you know, an album. Who? <laughs> exactly. Um, for someone like Taylor Swift, who took her music off Spotify and you know it's it's I understand where she's coming from too. So Katie, um, perhaps you can introduce uh, uh, Katie Peters, the Director of Government Relations at Pandora. Perhaps you can introduce Pandora, tell us what it is and how it plays in this complicated stack in this new digital world and of course how you're helping guys like Owen. Sure. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so Pandora, I assume most people in the audience have tried it out at one point or another or are one of the 80 million uh, monthly listeners who are tuning in to hear, uh, and that's just in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, Pandora is not a service that has on-demand offerings. We are purely radio. So once you listen to us and you like something, we provide a link that you can go to iTunes or the Amazon store and download it. But you can't, you know, like Spotify, put it in your locker, or put a playlist together and listen whenever you want. It's a, it is a non-interactive service in, um, in legal terms. So we think we sit at a really great crossroads for upcoming artists like Owen, where we are providing um, industry-leading royalty payments. Uh, we're up to almost $1.5 billion in royalties paid since our inception. We will pay $500 million just this year alone to artists and songwriters, labels, and publishers. Um, we're very proud of that. Our service relies on this, um, on this music uh, in order to attract listeners, and we are proud of, of the money we pay to those folks to access um, their work and their passion. Um, but we also are a discovery tool. 
Um, if you're like me and you listen to the service and you're, you know, doing dishes or cooking dinner and you hear something, you're like, what is that? That is amazing. And you pick up your phone or you look at your laptop, probably your phone, um, and you're like, I don't know who this is, but I want to find out more. So um, we think we are serving both of the needs of ensuring people are paid for what they've created, but at the same time, we're providing a great tool for discovery as well. Thank you, uh, Katie. Um, Trez Williams, who is the Senior VP of Business and Legal Af uh, Affairs at iHeart. Um, Trez, you're in a fairly similar business to, uh, iHeart is a fairly similar business to Pandora, isn't it? Sure, yeah, um, and again, thanks for having us as well, and um, you know, thanks for Congressman Johnson coming down, and, and Owen, which is a great, you know, love, love to hear your story, and love to hear that, um, you know, the, the primary way that folks discover your music is through radio, because that's what we do. Um, like Katie, where we operate iHeartRadio, it's a non-interactive service in legal terms, so, you know, different from Spotify, you can't just go and select every song that you want, it really is about music discovery as well. Um, we also are the largest terrestrial radio station operator in the country, uh, with over 850 stations uh, around the country in every, every, mar every major market. And um, we make available our terrestrial radio stations through our iHeartRadio application as well. So, you know, I, I, someone told me a great story earlier about, you know, I, I love that I, I think it was you, Mike, actually, I love that I live in L.A. and can listen to my, you know, hometown Seattle station on iHeart and, you know, just, you know, I love that too. I'm from Atlanta. I listen to my hometown station on iHeart, and uh, went living in New York. And um, you know, Owen, the story about KCRW. KCRW is available on iHeart as well. So just you know, extending the reach of those stations is what really iHeart's all about. And you know, creating that instead of you know, Spotify or Apple Music or Tidal or something like that. That's really about sort of being in your own listening to what you want to w listen to right then, sort of being, you know, you can imagine yourself being in your room with your headphones on versus when you're listening to radio, you want to sort of be part of the community and, you know, hear what the DJs are, are saying about what's the hot new music or, you know, what's going on with, uh, with in the news or, you know, what, how long is it going to take me to get to work today? So, um, you know, I think that we serve sort of a much different, you know, purpose than some of those streaming services. Thank you, Trez. Um, Mike Montgomery, the Executive Director of Cal Innovates. Mike, you're an expert on innovation. What does, um, what does uh, Owen's introduction tell us about the opportunities and challenges in the in innovation economy for uh, young artists like Owen? Uh, I, thank you, Andrew. I think that, that uh, Owen Owen straddles two worlds in a, in a really unique way because just months ago, he was a consumer just like me, right? And now he's an artist, and so he sees both sides of the coin, right? How does it work for consumers and how does it work for artists? Um, you know, a, a number of months ago, there was a Senate Judiciary hearing, and Senator Leahy said two things that I thought were really important. He said, the committee must, one, work toward ensuring fair comp uh, compensation for artists while ensuring robust competition in the marketplace. And I think those need to be the goals moving forward. Um, but, you know, there were some other interesting comments made. Um, Congressman Johnson said it's not rocket science. But the problem is we've turned it into rocket science, right? It's hard when you talk about consent decrees and the rate setting court. It is rocket science. And so how do people start to understand how this works? Um, you know, Owen, Owen finds his music on free sites. He's no different from most of us. About, I actually think it's more than 50% find our music or don't pay for, uh, for our music, right? So it's, we're living in this ad-supported freemium world. Um, and, you know, there's another comment that, that Owen made. He said he's not signed to a label and therefore he's lucky. Um, I think we need to take a closer look at what the labels are doing. And when we think about Pandora paying out 1.5 billion in royalty since its inception, there's a bottleneck. So where is that money going? And if artists don't feel that they're fairly compensated, but 
Pandora or iHeart are paying out greater than 50% of their revenue and royalties, then there is a bottleneck, and we've got to figure out how to, uh, how to fix that issue. Katie, perhaps you could talk, and again, I'm not sure how inside, excusing the pun, inside the beltway this audience is on, on the issues that Mike brings up, but perhaps you could talk broadly about the, the regulatory issues pertaining to what Mike just talked about. Sure, and I mean, looking out at the crowd, it's a pretty savvy group of folks on music licensing. Um, so I think one of the things I'd like to address about what you said is the notion of free, what is free, what's the role of free, um, and there's two kinds of free, right? There's piracy, which is universally bad, and um, we believe access to legal content decreases use of, uh, of pirated content. Um, but then there's also free to the listener, which is music you're paying for with your ears, and that you'll listen to an ad for 30 seconds in order to get five minutes of music. Um, that music is still monetized. That music still generates revenue for artists, for labels, for songwriters, for publishers. Um, there's roughly, in the studies we've done, about 50% Americans who say, I'm not going to pay for my music. Right? I'll listen to ads and I'll do that, but I'm never going to sign up for a subscription service. Um, Apple, it's, I think, $9.99 a month. Spotify, $9.99 a month. There's a certain tiering they have as well. Um, some people can't afford it. Uh, or some are just making that choice. Whatever the option is, there's 50% of Americans that can be monetized via ad-supported music. It's really important that we continue to make sure those folks continue to pay for music and that folks continue to get compensated for it. If you go the route of making ad-supported music unavailable to consumers, it, all it does is serve to increase piracy or turn them to services where there is no compensation. And so I think it's important for everyone to recognize that there's money on the table here. Um, let's make sure that the pie is really big, that we're bringing in all kinds of listeners to support all kinds of artists, uh, rather than saying there's only one way to do this. I think there's a lot of ways. And it's why you see so much competition in this marketplace. You have us, you have iHeart, you have a bonanza of other services, audio. We mentioned uh, Spotify. Google has a service now. They purchase songs. Um, there's a lot of choice out there for consumers. And so it's obviously a robust, um, robust industry. And we'll all continue to battle it out for, for listeners. Oh, and I saw you nodding when Katie mentioned that there was money on the table. I don't know if you actually looked on the table. Um, <laughs> Does it matter to you, though, how people pay for their music? And do you see a difference in your mind as an artist or indeed a consumer between the kind of services like Pandora and iHeart, which are ad-supported, and ones like maybe Apple Music, where people pay to subscribe? Uh, to be honest, right now, I don't think we're really at a place to say ad-supported is better or worse than subscription. Just because I feel like if we did that right now, everyone would turn to piracy. Um, uh, so, you know, my friends may like ad supported, I may like subscription, at least it's paying something. Um, so in my mind, nothing is different for uh, as, a, as an artist. Um, as a consumer, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm I subscribe to Spotify and I have the premium subscription um, for music that I want to search and want to be able to find um, and want to make a playlist. But then I love Pandora and I love iHeart for reasons where, you know, my music might come up and I people would be like, whoa, who is this? And, you know, go to that site um, or go to my page or go to my iTunes. Um, so as a consumer, I think they're both good. As an artist, I think they're both good. Um, but I, I so agree with what Katie's saying. There's money on the table, and we need to figure out how to distribute that. And I'm, like I said, I'm lucky that I'm not in a label, and um, I don't have to worry about another party coming in and taking certain money from me. Um, but I, I think a lot of my friends and a lot of people in my generation have a Netflix account, and they pay for Netflix. Why shouldn't they pay for Spotify. Why shouldn't they? You know, it, it seems like they believe somehow that music should be free. But we should be compensated. We should be paid. We're making this, you know. So I truly believe that 
either ad supported or subscription, at least it's paying. So Trez, I think we would all agree here that it's important for musicians to be paid. And as, um, as, uh, as Owen has said, he doesn't really see that much difference between ad supported music and uh, subscription paid music as long as he sees the money. Would it be fair to say, and again, we're in, we're in a Raven House, where a Raven Building, where this is a, a, a political discussion, a political audience. Would it be fair to say that the law at the moment discriminates against ad-supported businesses? Um, well, I think right now, you know, we've just gotten through a cycle on the Copyright Royalty Board and, and Pandora and us were, you know, the, the major participants as well as the National Association of Broadcasters. Um, you know, that process involves this, what Katie is talking about, sort of the backstop, that there is that guaranteed access to a license that can be, uh, w with rates that are set on, on fair terms, that, you know, we can continue to offer those kind of ad-supporting services, ad-supported services. Um, and, you know, through that process, we've kind of for the first time ever gotten some of the best evidence that we've ever gotten. Um, you know, very sort of thick book of evidence, you know, that the, the prior proceedings really didn't have. They really relied on evidence that was based on what interactive services pay. Um, and now we've got some new evidence that came in on our deals with uh, the in independent uh, label community as well as with Warner Music Group. Um, and, you know, making sure that that evidence gets in has been super important to us and has enabled the judges to, for the first time, really, we think, set a rate that's really the f most fair rate that we've had to date, and that's the hope. Um, you know, that said, I think that, you know, if the rate that the labels are advocating for is set, then I think we're going to have a real problem continuing to grow and continuing to innovate, like, like Katie's talking about, and continuing to allow at these ad-supporting services to exist. Because you know, I think that there are those who believe that if we go, if we set the rates high enough, then services will f be forced to start charging consumers. And we think that that's bad for everybody. We want to continue to be able to offer these free choices for consumers. And uh, Owen, I assume you would agree with Trez that the last thing we want are some sort of regulatory arrangements which makes it harder and harder for guys like this to exist. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, I think that Honestly, I think that ad-supported streaming services are great. Um, and I think that, like you guys, ra I think radio, it, at least in L.A., from where I'm from, it's so, uh, and I hate to say this, but it's, it's becoming harder and harder to get people to listen to the radio. Um, and so... You know, 102.7, which used to be the biggest radio station in L.A., none of, no one's listening to anymore. Um, but then again, people are listening to Pandora and iHeart. Um, so if we can figure out a way to move it, move the radio to online radio or, you know, ad-supported sites, I think that's great. So, Mike, as our authority, at least on this panel on innovation, it, it's more than, um, it's more than just... The artist, isn't it? We're talking about an entire, and I excuse this word, I'm from Silicon Valley, so these are the kinds of words we use. Uh, but it, it, it is an entire innovation ecosystem. You will know that word, ecosystem, uh, at stake here, right? It's, it's more than just aspiring artists, it's listeners, it's consumers, it's technology companies. So we're talking, the stakes are quite high when it comes to innovation here. Uh, right, and thank you for the disclaimer, um, by the way. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a lot, there's a lot going, uh, going on here. But, um, you know, if we talk about, uh, I, I kind of want to get back to, to how this whole uh, ad-supported system works here. Um, and I think that, that if, we, um, if we veer away from ad-supported radio, if, uh, excuse me, streaming, if we... Um, if we raise the rates, if we weaken the consent decrees, um, that's going to decrease consumer choice, um, and it's going to take it's going to take us back, um, you know, to the the first sort of piracy that I remember is my sister standing by the radio with her tape recorder, waiting for a Madonna song to come on the radio so she could hit record and we could listen to it over and over and over again. Those days 
may not be um, may not be gone, right? Um, so we did some polling. Calinovates did some polling that uh, that we released uh, today, and among 18 to 30, 18 to 34 year olds, and they're kind of you know the gold standard or the unicorn, if you want to use a, a very popular word. Um, say that 54% uh, say they're less likely to pirate music if um, freemium or ad-supported uh, um, uh, options exist. And so it's about, it, it really does come back to the consumer. Um, and if we're, if we're consumer uh, focused and consumer first, this whole industry will be able to move forward. But um, raising rates, especially, I believe, is going to be an assault on innovation. And that's something that we can't have. We need to have more platforms for Owen's music to thrive. Um, we need to be able to listen to, uh, uh, you know, a Seattle Seahawks uh, interview on Cairo Radio in Seattle from Los Angeles. Right, we need to discover everything that we can via Pandora because I'm running out of options for my four-year-old to listen to that she likes anymore. We've got all these options. We live in this great world. It's kind of like the golden era uh, again. But if we raise rates, poof, it could be gone. Um, Amy is also going to distribute some, some note cards. So uh, we'll go on for a few more minutes. And then we certainly invite questions. So if you can write some questions, please. Uh, Please do so, and, uh, and, and, and also write your name. Uh, let's talk, again, more broadly in political terms. Uh, uh, Katie or, or Trez, you can jump in here. Is this a political fight between innovation, innovative companies like yours, and legacy organizations and companies, the rights groups, uh, the labels, are they the ones who really are against the future, against innovation? Um, I don't think I would characterize it that way. Um, change is hard, right? We're in a period of change in how music's distributed. And with any change, there's some push and pull and conflict. And um, I think that's normal, that's healthy. And if you look at uh, music distribution, going back to the phonograph and even earlier, um, you know, this is not an uncommon period of time or not to be expected and we'll get through it and we'll move on and to Congressman Johnson's comments, another four and a half million years of music uh, being made. Um, so from Pandora's view, we're kind of looking past this and saying, okay, when this all settles out, how are we all living together and working together? We all need each other. Um, you can't distribute without a distributor. You can't have a distribution service without music to play. And um, it's just a matter of finding that middle place where we can all live and um, thrive. And we believe it's possible, um, but we just gotta get through this period of time. Um, and I think one thing that doesn't get discussed a lot here that's really important is the value proposition beyond microsense. So we get tied down in these pennies per spin and it, it gets, it, it kind of gets away from the larger picture of what is it we're actually doing here. We're connecting you know, people who are creating music with their fans. That's how you monetize. And beyond just you know pennies per spin, we start talking about things like, well, how does Pandora support an artist's career? So we have something called the Artist Marketing Platform, free service for artists to log in and look at their data and see not just how often their songs are being spun, but how often people are creating stations based on them as an artist, that, um, just based on their songs. A really fascinating trend we see is we know an artist is about to pop and really blow up. When people stop creating stations based on a single song and start creating stations based on that artist. Um, and when we see that happening and that trend switching over, we know that person's about ready to just really have their career take off. Um, there's a lot of interesting things out there you can do with ticket sales. A lot of the money right now in music is in touring, it's in merchandise. Um, Pandora recently partnered with the Rolling Stones for their zip code tour. We sold out um, our allocation of 50,000 tickets for that tour in 24 hours. 
So the connection we can make uh, between the artist and their fans, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg as to what's possible. Um, our next step is gonna be um, audio recordings for artists to put a bumper in before you hear their song. Say, hey, this is whoever, and thanks for listening, and this is my next, um, the next song is my latest release, and I hope you'll download it on iTunes. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity out there when the innovation grows and thrives, and I think it's, you know, it's a rising tide. It's gonna lift all boats in the industry. Trez, do you wanna add something to that? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with all that. I think, um, you know, like Katie said, the, the value proposition is beyond just the, the sort of royalties paid through to sound exchange. It's really as much, if not more, about introducing artists to their, to their fans, to their listeners. Um, and, uh, you know, like Pandora, you know, our programs like On The Verge, which is, you know, where we have, you know, emerging artists that we get behind and play them across on sta stations in the format across our entire network. Um, you know, our music summits where we invite the independent labels for an entire day to sit in front of our 150 top programmers across our network. Um, you know, we're do constantly doing things to work with the music industry. So I, I, I would agree that I, I wouldn't really characterize it as a fight. I would characterize it as sort of trying to find the optimal path. Um, and, uh, you know, our, we have a very strong relationship with, in particular, you know, obviously record labels, but also, you know, artists and artist managers. And we're continuing to try and really develop that. And, you know, because, I mean, people talk about radio and records. That's the sort of, you know, key core symbiotic relationship in the music industry. So, so Mike, uh, guys like Pandora and iHeart, uh providing the, the infrastructure, the marketing infrastructure for aspiring upcoming artists uh, like Owen, uh, maybe also some of the legal stuff. Uh, let me ask you, you know, the, the, the question that many of us are asking, in this new world, what is the place, what is the role of rights organizations and record labels that had the central role in the old economy and are still struggling, perhaps, for a role in this new economy? Uh, well, I know that Owen isn't going to be making $2 per uh, CD sale um, moving forward. And artists don't make money selling CDs anymore. Um, but, you know, so there is this, we're in this new digital distribution platform economy. But I think, it, it, and maybe for the first time ever in this room, I'm going to invoke uh, the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> um, cash rules everything around me. Right, and so if you go back to the Sony hack and you take a look at, um, at the $42.5 million signing bonus that, um, that Spotify paid Sony, uh, and you take a look at the nine, uh, more or less $9 million in free ad sales that Sony could make on, uh, on the platform, none, zero. Zero dollars and zero cents went to artists. That was money that went straight to the labels, right? And so maybe it's time to rethink the relationship that artists have with labels. Maybe it's time to think about what, what Katie just said a moment ago about this direct uh, artist relationship that can happen with these, these distribution platforms. This is, this is opportunity. This is a chance for um, uh, you know, I wrote about a, a couple months ago about a guy named Eric Hutchinson, who's an artist, um, and his music is on Pandora, um, and it's a it's a really great story. He was he was setting up his tour, and he left um, coincidentally Seattle off his uh, off his tour list. But then he went on to Pandora's back end, and he found out that he was getting a lot of plays in Seattle, not on the radio but on uh, Pandora. So he added Seattle to his tour stop and it sold out within minutes. Um, those are the opportunities that these platforms can provide artists. And in order to make sure that they can be maintained and that we can increase the amount of innovation that goes into them, we've gotta make sure that we have uh, consumer-friendly options. So that would mean um, ad-supported options. That would mean that we've got, you know, you look at my phone and I've got probably 10 different music options on my phone alone. I want all of them. I don't want one, you know, I don't want, say for instance, Apple Music or Tidal and that 
to be that. I want everything I can get, and I think that artists should want that too, and I know that's good for the entire music e ecosystem. So, um, you know, it, it's probably time for a new construct. Um, please do use my word, ecosystem, Mike. Um, Owen, does the, Mike brought up the Sony hack and the revelations about the amount of money that appears to be wasted and certainly questions about the morality of some of these organizations. As an aspiring artist, does that trouble you? Yeah, um, that's why I'm not with a label. Um, and you're an insider. I mean, you're, you, you know this world as well as anyone. Um, and I don't think labels are necessarily bad. Um, I think that ultimately, if you want to be heard, um, and I've been very lucky, I'm not on a label and I've been heard, but I think for a lot of people, if you want to be heard, the label gives you that extra push once you're already at your, once you've already done enough and most you can do, that label gives you that extra push and I think that's great. Um, but I, I really think that I, I love what you guys are saying about artist, d direct artist relationships. Um, and I think that's what I'm going for is, you know, ha having a manager, having somebody who, who, you know, can directly or yourself can directly contact Pandora or iHeart and see how, where you're going. And, and like Katie told me earlier, my trend on Pandora is going up. And that's so great to hear that, you know, I, I can go and look on uh, you know, Pandora and see exactly how I'm doing, where I'm doing, how, uh, in what state, in what place I'm blowing up. Um, and I think, yeah, I, th I, I think that ha being able, being an artist and having a direct relationship with somebody who's putting out your music and distributing your music is huge. Um, and I, I just think that an extra party always makes things confusing. Yeah, so just, just to be clear, I mean, we love having relationships with artists. Um, for me, it's like, you know, the coolest people I get to interact with. No offense to folks in this room. Um, but uh, in a way, we view ourselves as a conduit, right? We're trying to connect an artist to his fan or her fan, and we're the mechanism for doing that. So while we want to provide all that information, access, and relationship, we also just want to be the facilitator of having that direct relationship. Totally. Uh, Owen, I'm going to read the, these questions are of course anonymous, so this is a really hard one. I know you're not going to be able to answer it, but you can pretend to. He said, Owen, if you could choose a single outlet, and it's of course a single outlet for your next song debut, would it be Pandora, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple, or Kiss FM Los Angeles? Thanks. <laughs> um, I feel like if I say one, I'm going to be... We'll make up another one. Um, so you're not a politician. You seem to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> but isn't that the point that in this new world, you don't need a single outlet? But yeah, completely. Um, I think that if I, let's say my next song came out on Kiss FM, it would reach a certain amount of people. Um, and it might do really well. But let's say my next song came out on Pandora and was on the... Uh, Sam Smith radio. So if you, you know, type in Sam Smith, it was the next song to come up. That could do even better. So, I, and if it was on iHeart, it could be on every, what was the thing called, Ver, The Verge, where it's on. Sounds like a perfect project for On The Verge. Right, exactly, where it's, uh, where it's all over. Um, so a single outlet for music, I don't think is a, is a choice. And Mike, that's the old world, exclusives, isn't it? The new world is one of, uh, broad distribution of working with many partners. Yeah, that's that's the whole point. Um, artists can have broad reach. Um, consumers can find exactly what they want, where they want, when they want, and why they want. It's it's this is this is the new world. We've got to have you know increased opportunities and choices, and this is about consumer choice. So we're all in agreement. It's, it's rather painful. I thought this was going to be more controversial. Everyone's in agreement. We need more choice, more innovation, give consumers as much as many legal choices as they can have. So what's the issue here? The issue is, of course, pertaining to, um, and, and Trez brought this up earlier, some legislative regulatory issues coming up. So let me ask the panel. Let me begin with Trez. And I, again, this is another question, anonymous. How do you suggest uh, finding the 
optimum path, and I assume that's in music regulation or only these issues that are pertaining to, what are the steps that need to be taken? So let's get very granular here. What concrete steps, Trez, do we need to guarantee the kind of innovation that we've all agreed is essential both for music artists and consumers? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, getting into the weeds, you know, we, like I said, we went, just went through the, the CRB, the Copyright Royalty Board cycle to set the rates, the statutory rates for the next five years starting Jan 1 of 16. Um, so, you know, establishing a fair rate, <laughs> um, you know, not a rate that would... What is a fair rate, Trez? What does that mean? Uh, well, lower than they are today, I think. Um, you know, just to put things, just to get a little bit granular, uh, we pay um, 0.25 cents per play today. Um, a service like Pandora pays less, pays 0.14 cents today. Um, you know, at the at the CRB, uh, Sound Exchange has made the argument that the the current statutory rate is what we pay. <laughs> Um, I think if you sort of step back and look at it, you know, Pandora being by far the largest webcaster paying, you know, 0.14 cents per play, I would, I would argue that that's a little closer to the current statutory rate. Um, so, and, and what the sound exchange team has advocated for is, you know, 0.25 cents per play and increasing and then layering on top of that a 55% of revenue component. And does that rate not really enable you to run a viable business? No. No, we, we would have to put listening caps on our service. We'd have to, you know, consider shutting down parts of our service, um, you know, changing the way that we serve advertising, potentially not having an ad supported, you know, certain types of our service wouldn't even be ad supported. It would be, um, you know, we'd have to charge. Um, so, you know, what we want to do is continue to provide access to the great services that consumers love and really the way that we think, the, the only way that we're going to be able to do that is if the CRB sets a fair rate starting next So year. music's fate is pretty dark. Does this worry you, Owen, that, 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 that Trez is saying that unless this rate changes, companies like iHeart are going, are going to be, if not forced out of business, certainly forced to change their services? Yeah. Um, I think that paying to discover new music um, or, you know, having artists paid to be discovered is, is always a good thing. Um, so I think that, you know, ads and and only having subscriptions and let's say iHeart was, this will never happen, but was shut down and, and, only, and you had to pay to, um, to go on iHeart. I don't think as many people would go because the whole... The whole point of iHeartRadio and Pandora is discovering new music, listening to new things, finding out new artists. Um, so I don't think that that paying to discover should ever be a thing. Katie, do you concur with Trez? Is is this really the, this rate issue? Is it an, an existential crisis for companies like yours? It's so dramatic. Um, I don't think I would call it an existential crisis. I mean, it's a legal proceeding. Well, and when I mean <laughs> existential, I mean if, 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 if it doesn't change, it, it challenges your existence as a business. Well, look, um, so we've been a public company since 2011. Uh, currently, we're paying 45% of our revenue in sound recording royalties, uh, which is the rate that's, that we're discussing right now that is set by the Copyright Royalty Board. Um, obviously, there's a ceiling at which companies can continue to operate in the way they currently do, reach mass consumers and have that appeal. As I said, we have 80 million listeners tuning in every month um, and, and still offer that service. So, um, yes, it's important. Um, yes, it's something that it's important for Congress to pay attention to. Um, I wouldn't say it's a doomsday scenario that that online radio goes out of business tomorrow, but it is important to get the rate right. Mike, existential threat to the ecosystem? Yes. Um, yes, I, I, you know, when, when Pandora's paying 45% of its revenues and iHeart is thinking about the prospect of 55% of its revenues um, going to royalties, um, what happens to innovation, and what happens if what happens if ad supported goes away? What does that do to the consumers who rely upon free music right now? What does that do to them? 
they're left out. So who does this leave in the dust? If we're if we're left with um, with say for instance an Apple versus Google fight on music, consumers lose. There are a lot of people who a can't afford it or b don't want to. So um, you know we might have to go back to to tapping on on lecterns to to hear music. So um, maybe that's maybe that's a little far, but. Um, <laughs> You know, the, there it, it's it's not cheap. I think to be able to um, to hire engineers to be able to iterate a platform like Pandora or iHeart or any of the ones that you like. Um, but when you take say 50% right off the top, um, innovation becomes a lot harder. So bad for innovation, bad for consumers. Um, it's a lose lose. Well, you've kind of answered this question, but I'm going to ask it to Trez as well. If I bear, this is another question from the floor. If I build a better service, a better algorithm, a better interface, or a better ad placement strategy, how difficult will it be for me to launch in the present licensing environment? Trez? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, right now, uh, you know, you have to. I, I think really the only way to to do it reasonably would be to stick with the statutory license. I think if you, unless you're well funded, you know, we we read about the you know what you read in the press about the kind of deals that uh, Spotify's cut. Um, you know, you really have to have a sort of a rate a non interactive service. Um, uh, and you know the way the rates are now, I, I would say it's not a it's not set up to be a profitable business, but it's set up so, and, and again, we're very hopeful, you know, given the evidence that's come out at the CRB that the rates starting in January will be more reasonable. And, and so, um, you know, look, if I was going to start up a startup today, a radio startup today, maybe, you know, uh, it, there is a very simple way to obtain licenses the generally, uh, to obtain the licenses that you need. Um, you know, I don't think we've talked a lot about what's going on with the ASCAP and BMI and the PRO worlds, and you would mentioned the consent decrees a couple times. Uh, that probably is the more complicated part of, you know, if you were trying to start a, a radio and non-interactive service today, that would be the complicated part of it. But if the rates go to where SoundExchange wants them to go January 1, it would be even more difficult for a startup to start. Um, you know, you're looking at, you know, not being profitable, on, you know, I don't see how you could be profitable and offer a compelling consumer proposition under those rates. Mike, did and, you want and to so, And so let's just think about this from a Silicon Valley perspective. What happens with venture capital, right? Who's going to come in, you know, when, when, you know, somebody's looking for seed money or an A round, who's going to go fund a business that has to take 55% off the top? I, I, you know, that, that's kind of an open question, but I think we know the answer. Absolutely. Katie, did you want to add something on this, on this issue of uh, startup people who have something more innovative and how difficult it is to launch something in, in the current licensing environment? Yeah, I think um, the money is obviously important, but I think the access to music is actually maybe a more difficult proposition, ensuring that music remains accessible so that it can reach consumers and be monetized. Um, I think that's that may be an even more important thing for policymakers to focus on is ensuring that um, services can still put it out there and it can be monetized well and artists and songwriters can be compensated. Final question. This is, I think, this is really an Owen question. Owen, what makes a modern musician profit, uh, quote unquote, profitable or successful in a world where you're not signing a clear cut? Uh, set dollar label contract? Um, well, I think that comes down to touring, um, ultimately. And I think a lot of money um, is made in touring. Um, but I think, that, I think that to be a successful or profitable artist, you have to be opening for some, you know, an upcoming artist, you have to be opening for someone, you have to be touring, you have to be going to different places and, and getting the certain exposure you need. And yes, of course, that comes on, you know, Pandora that, you know, if somebody hears your music and loves it and buys it, that's a, that's great. But I think that that's not ever going to make an artist, an upcoming artist successful or profitable. Um, I really think that it comes 
with the territory and and I think you need to be going out there and ex and getting the exposure you need live face to face we've been a very patient audience and we're going to end now I want to just go around the horn on the, uh, the, 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 the the panel, just very final, final remarks. Guys, uh, maybe we'll begin with Mike. Message to Washington, D.C. on this. We're all in agreement about innovation, of its challenges and opportunities. What, 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 what is the role of Washington, D.C., the political process in this, to guarantee that young artists like Owen can put food on their table, and that we as consumers, as the congressman made clear, music's in our bones, in our blood. We all love to listen to it. What needs to happen, Mike? Uh, really short, don't raise the royalty rates. Don't weaken the consent decrees. And let us keep enjoying music. Simple as that. Trez. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I agree with, with that. I think we're all in agreement. You know, we got to keep things simple. Um, you know, keep the rates fair, um, set it up so that businesses can be profitable. You know, um, we always talk about rate times volume equals total dollars. So we want to have a rate that allows us to really ramp up the volume. Katie? I mean, this stuff's really complicated. Um, I've been here 15 years, hands down the most complicated issue I've ever worked on. Um, it's important to understand it. and. Um, I think the less emotion you take out of the conversation and more you have a real conversation about how these things work and function, um, the more likely we are to arrive at a policy that makes sense for everyone in the ecosystem. And Owen, our star certainly for today, what's your message to Washington, D.C.? Um, like Congressman Johnson said, music should be basic. Music is basic. Um, it's universal. Uh, and, you know, it's not rocket science, even though we've kind of proved that it is. Um, it shouldn't be. So let's keep it simple. Well, thank you, guys. I think this was a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>